Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me. I'm excited to talk to you about the Healing Center. Um, hopefully you can hear me. My voice is a little soft. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what we do at the Healing Center and what it is and how it relates to um, what we're talking about here at this, at this conference. So basically, we're a small nonprofit in Northeast Seattle, and we provide grief and loss services um, for across the lifespan, so starting at age four all the way to 80 plus. Um, we have a lot of different groups, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but one of the sort of core elements of the Healing Center is our mission, which is that we offer a safe and loving place that honors grief. So we believe that people can move through their process in, in the way that they see fit, that we as experts are not here to tell people how to grieve, but instead to provide a safe place and a community um, in which they can do the grief that they need to do, do the process the way they need to do it. So here's a list of all of our groups. Um, our groups are, for kids, are divided up by age. And so we have first through third, we have littles, which is ages four and five, um, pre-K pre and kindergarten. Then we have uh, healing club first through third grade, healing club fourth through sixth grade, and then teen group. So the difference between teen group and the other groups is teen group is for any kind of loss. Sue mentioned um, losing a friend to suicide. This is especially prevalent for teens. So this is a group where you can come if you've lost um, a friend, a close family member, a partner, um, or a mom, dad, or sibling to any kind of loss. The other groups, uh, the other kid groups are for sibling and parent loss only. Um, we also have a young adult group, which is also any kind of loss. Memory keepers is a spouse partner loss. And then the rest of our adult groups, besides, um, no, actually, besides adult survivors of suicide, the, the core of our sort of program is, and, and what it was founded on, is these three groups for people who have lost a spouse or a partner to um, an unexpected or premature death. Um, and those groups are divided up by the time since the loss. So we have an early loss group, so people who have just lost somebody and maybe a year to 18 months out from the loss. So they're going through those initial sort of phases of their grief process. And then we found that those, those phases kind of change and the grief process changes over time. And we have transition group, which is after about a year, year and a half, until about four years out since the time of the death. Um, and then we have perspectives group, which is our only group that's peer-led. Um, it meets monthly, and it's really more of a community group um, for people who have gone through the process at the Healing Center and want to continue to be part of community. And then we have uh, adult survivors of suicide. That doesn't have a time frame. It's um, for adults who've lost a spouse or a partner to suicide, and that's facilitated by Sue. Um, and then we just added another group, Adult General Loss, it, and that was sort of to catch the rest of people that were calling in and that desire to provide services for, for other people that were calling in and needing, and needing um, some support. So I'm hoping just to talk to you a little bit today about how we at the Healing Center talk to kids and teens about traumatic death um, and things to consider after traumatic death and what happens in a grief support group. So talking to kids about traumatic death, this is always a, um, a difficult topic and I think sounds really, really scary to clinicians, especially considering, and I think we were talking earlier about how there's not a whole lot of training um, in grief and bereavement in general, and especially about how to talk to kids. Um, so the basic philosophy that, that I adhere to is to be calm and coherent and clear and speak to a child in an age-appropriate manner, but, but not hiding things from them. So in other words, giving them the space to ask questions and also um, allowing yourself to be honest with your own grief process. So kids are looking to you to see how you do your grief process. They're looking to you as a model. So to be authentic and to um, be clear in, in what happened. Um, so talking, for example, um, a good way to talk to a small child about suicide. So I just put up a really clear example. Um, Daddy's brain was very sick, and Daddy was very, 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 very sad, and it made him not want to live anymore. And the important thing to remember there is to qualify that not all people who have a sick brain and not all people who are very, very sad um, want to stop living. 
you don't because kids will generalize from from um, if you know if one person dies in a hospital that means if you go to the hospital you're going to die so to be sure to be very clear about that and qualify that um, I think one thing that's important, especially as parents, um, is to realize that your kids may want to talk to other adults. They might not want to talk to you about what's going on for them, and this is especially relevant for teens. Um, so to work with your kid, your client, to come up with a list of other trusted adults that they can speak to that aren't their parents, and to be okay with that if you're the parent. Um, and make a plan to discuss how fe when feelings arise, because things change over time. Um, make a plan to, to have moments when you can discuss it, when you can have um, a special time set aside to talk about your feelings or to ask questions and answer questions. <clears throat> so talking to teens. Um, you know the thing. The thing with teens is authenticity. I think is the main is the main uh, takeaway message. I would say, and so um, making sure that if you don't know the answer to a question, to be clear about that and say, you know, I, I don't know, and that's okay. You don't have to be an authority. A lot of a lot of us don't have answers. We don't know why um, a car accident happens or a suicide occurs. Um, and then to educate teens a bit about other ways that grief can sort of show up for them. So not only um, is it an emotional issue, but it can also manifest you know, physically, it can manifest in school, um, in the way that you're able to concentrate, in the way that you relate to your peers. There's a lot of different areas of a teen's life that can be impacted by a traumatic death. And then to be, sort of meet that teen where they're at. So what preferred form of communication do they want to use? Do they want to journal to themselves? Do they want to use a, a text chat line at the crisis clinic? Um, you know, do they want to talk on the phone only or email? Whatever it is that a teen feels comfortable doing, meet them in their arena and, and communicate with them that way. And then again, just of course, to emphasize again, being calm, clear, direct. Use the word suicide. Use the word death. Use the person who died. Um, and to talk about with a teen that you know, death, death by suicide is almost always re the result of a very complicated, long story um, that often involves a, you know, a mental illness or a brain disorder that, uh, like depression, and the, it ended in suicide. Um, and providing a non-judgmental space, and that goes along with authenticity. So these are just things that uh, grieving kids and teens want you to know. Um, so I deserve to be informed and included. I might not feel or act the way you think I should. This comes up a lot, especially with young kids, parents of young kids. Um, they see that their kid might talk about the death and feel a little bit sad for a little while, and then next thing you know they're off playing and doing something else and this is very hard for for an adult to wrap their brain around because we as adults have decided that you know once we're grieving and we're sad that's the way we're going to stay until it, until it changes kids kind of dip in and out of grief um, they know again they know what they need to do to grieve they know what their process is to trust that and to honor that and it might not look the way you think it should um, I'm reacting to your reaction, so the idea that we're modeling grief um, for them. So they're not only grieving their own loss, they're grieving the loss of how you used to be before the death, um, or how you're reacting to the death. My feelings change over time, so as kids move through developmental periods, um, the way that they respond to the death changes. So a little girl who loses her dad at age four is going to be concerned about, you know, who's going to read my bedtime story. Um, and then as she moves through her life at age 16, she might be thinking, you know, why isn't dad here to meet my first boyfriend or girlfriend? So things change and their consideration about their grief and their loss changes as they move through their developmental periods. And kind of like what I was saying before, I want to be with my friends and I, and I don't want to just be sad all the time and that's okay. So when considering Talking about grief, there's five um, sort of major determinants that affect the grieving process. So the age of the person who died, but also the age of the person who is experiencing the death. Um, the relationship that you've had with the person. So, you know, one thing we talk about a lot is that, you know, a parent 
and a child may be both grieving, the parent may be grieving her spouse, and the child is grieving her father. It's the same person, but it's a different relationship that's being, that's, that they're grieving. Um, what does your support system look like? So pre and post, and that often changes, especially for kids who've had a traumatic death. Um, a lot of friends can't really relate to that anymore, and that's one of the things that we hope to provide at the Healing Center, is a place where kids can come and they meet other kids who have had the same sort of experience. Um, because at school and other venues in their life, they, they suddenly might feel you know, isolated. The health of the survivor, so mental and physical health. Um, how, how was this person prior to the death, um, mentally and physically, and how has the death impacted their health? And then, of course, the nature of the death, which is a lot of what we're talking about today. So some considerations in traumatic grief, that the sense of safety and security is shattered for a child, um, especially not only, um, like I said before, not only has the death occurred suddenly and without any sort of notice or chance to say goodbye, the people in the support system have completely changed as well. So they're grieving the loss of a parent or a primary figure, but they're also grieving that whole community and how they used to relate to that child. Um, your beliefs and your values are put into question. You see your, your remaining parent or your remaining sibling sort of questioning how, why did this happen? And that makes you as a child also question that and as an adult. Um, this is a really big one for kids. If, it, if my mom can die, then my dad can die. Then who's going to take care of me? So remember that they're generalizing. If this happened to one person, this can happen to the next person in my life. And then the stigma, which was talked about earlier this morning, um, you know, the, the stigma that kids get when they, when they go into school and, and people find out how mom or dad died or sibling died, of course there's a whole bunch of social stuff around suicide and homicide um, and, and what that means. And with suicide, I think this is one of the biggest things that I especially heard actually with adults when I facilitated the um, SOS group at the crisis clinic was this whole idea of my person would have rather be dead than be with me. And that's really hard to think about. And so coming together in support and being able to talk about that and say that out loud to other people who have had that thought is very powerful. And then judgment of society and media coverage and other sort of stigma-related things. So one of the things that we've done at the Healing Center, which um, has happened to work out so far, is we used to have a uh, children's survivor of suicide group, so kids who've lost their parent or sibling to suicide. So they were sort of separated out from the other kids. Um, and for a couple of reasons, one, because the group was sort of atrophying and resources were limited, we sort of um, put those kids in with the general group. So kids were now placed in groups based on their age rather than this particular group for suicide. Um, as we've gone over time, unfortunately, we've gotten a lot more kids who've had parents die by suicide or siblings. And we've chose not to um, start up a children's SOS group because I've found observing groups that kids do really well in understanding each other and understanding what it means to have lost that relationship and how can we sort of grieve through this together and understand each other rather than um, perseverating on how that person died. And that's especially true with the younger kids. Um, so, so far it's, it's, it's worked out and I feel like I think that we'll continue to do that. In the teen group it comes up a little bit more, um, but kids are still very accepting and, a ch and it's a chance to sort of destigmatize what suicide is. And I think it's a powerful opportunity for kids to speak to, you know, this is how my mom died. She hung herself. She had depression. And then the next person says, my mom died because she had a long battle with breast cancer. And so these are kids that are together in groups talking about the fact that the death occurred and how their relationships were um, affected in the rest of their lives and what it means to them to lose their mom or dad or sibling. We have a lot of different ways that we do um, what we do in grief group. So we have a lot of different modalities. So um, the first part of group, we get together and we eat pizza together and we just sort of have community time so that you're not walking into the healing center slammed with, it's time to process your grief. Um, so we do some community stuff first and then we do opening circle 
where kids are asked to uh, say their name and say the name of the person who died and say how they died if they want to. Um, you can always pass. And then we do either a book reading or um, some kind of topic around grief-related issues, anger, um, sadness, remembering the person. And then after that, we go upstairs and there's art therapy, um, sand tray, um, air hockey, costumes. It's just all kinds of stuff for kids to sort of work out in whatever way they need to um, their loss. And I've noticed, just um, anecdotal, you know, I've noticed in group that kids who've had a, a traumatic death that are coming into group that have experienced a traumatic death are more likely to go upstairs and participate in the symbolic play that is happening upstairs, so the art and the sand tray, um, and, and even the room full of stuffed animals, they're doing some symbolic play in there, rather than sort of talking about it in, in opening circle. And part of that's age related, but I think part of it also is due to the nature of the death, that sometimes it's easier to um, participate in an art project or um, play in the sand tray and sort of um, work it out that way rather than um, trying to put words to something that they may or may not have the vocabulary for. I mean, I think we as adults don't often have the vocabulary for these things. So I just talked about that. So, um, so basically, the groups we run on the Seattle Public School schedule, and so in the beginning of the year, we sort of try to just establish safety and getting to know each other. Um, and then I, from there, try to design the curriculum based on Warden's four tasks of grief, um, which are to accept the reality of the loss, to work through the pain of grief, to adjust to a world in which the deceased is missing, and then to find a lasting connection to that deceased while embarking on a new life. And like I said, these are some of the, all the different things that we do at um, the Healing Center. This is just, this quote's really, I like it because it talks a little bit more about how you can put, um, how you can go through your grief process without having to put words to it. This is just an example of an activity that we do at the Healing Center. It was adapted from the Dougie Center, which is another uh, a huge internationally known grief center in Portland. Um, and it's a, it's a mask activity where kids are asked to think about the mask that they put out to the world outside and then how that compares to how they're really feeling on the inside. And so that's a really um, rich discussion that can occur around since my dad died, I have been, you know, happy and okay at school because I have to be. But on the inside, I feel you know, I feel pain, or I feel relief, or I feel anger. And so allowing kids to sort of talk about that and then um, paint masks with actual physical artistic representations of what they're feeling. And this is just my favorite quote about children's grief. If you're old enough to love, you're old enough to grieve. So that's all if you have any questions.